Cool. Okay. Awesome. We'll have the time here. Okay. Cool. Okay, so I think we can start. So, um, welcome everyone. So, my name is Ricardo. Uh, I'm a software engineer at CERN. Um, Hello, and I'm Robert Vasek. Uh, I'm a student of informatics at the University of Vilnius, Slovakia. During my first year of the master's degree, but for the past eight months, I had the amazing opportunity of having my internship at CERN with Ricardo as my supervisor. I was Hi. working on uh, CSI surface and manual integration into Kubernetes. Okay, cool. So today we'll we'll talk about the work we've been doing. Um, it's been so these are the topics we'll, we'll cover. A uh, quick introduction to CERN. I'm sure uh, you've seen other presentations already uh, during this uh, summit or other summits. So CERN is uh, um, located in Geneva, across the Swiss, uh, close to Geneva, across the Swiss-French border. Uh, it was founded in 1954. It has 22 member states. And it has as main mission uh, fundamental science. Uh, and we try to answer like big questions, uh, like what is 96% of the universe ma made of? What's dark matter? What's dark energy? Uh, what was the state of matter just after the Big Bang? And why isn't there any antimatter in the universe? Or why don't we see it as it's supposed to be in the same amount as, as matter? Uh, to try to answer these questions, we build very large machines. The big one we have right now is the Large Hadron Collider. So this is a picture of, uh, of the accelerator. Uh, it's a tunnel of 27 kilometers in uh, circumference, and it's 100 meters underground. So here we accelerate protons in different directions, uh, close to the speed of light. We increase their energy, and then we make them collide in specific points where we built this massive uh, particle physics experiments. This is a picture of the CMS detector. Uh, you can see the people here, there to have an idea of the size. The cavern is, I believe, 40 by 40 meters, and it's totally full with, with this detector. It's also 100 meters underground. Uh, so the result of all of this is that from these collisions, we generate a lot of data. We generate uh, uh, tens of petabytes per year that we need to store and analyze. For this, we have a, a large uh, cloud, private cloud based on OpenStack. You can see on the top that we currently have uh, just over 300,000 cores. Uh, we have 36,000 VMs, uh, around 10,000 hypervisors. And then you can see uh, the Magnum clusters. So these are mostly Kubernetes clusters. These are container clusters. We also support Swarm and Mesos but they're mostly Kubernetes. And every time we do a screenshot, this keeps increasing, which is a sign that uh, containers are getting more and more popular at CERN. So right now we have more than 400 clusters. Um, so right. we jump to the topic. Okay, so I, I would like to open this pre presentation by having a look at the title. So let's see. The dynamic storage provisioning of Manila slash CFFS shares on Kubernetes. So that's quite a mouthful. But what's really important here that, as for my part of the presentation, it sounds, it, it sounds like I should know what I'm talking about, right? So, but anyway, uh, it does serve a purpose. Uh, it basically says that you know, the uh, users of Kubernetes should be now able to create and use manual shares of their OpenStack cloud from within Kubernetes. So while this title uh, covers all the technical aspects of this presentation, oh, this one really says how the development actually went down. Because to be frank with you, uh, when I was finished with the implementation of CSISFS and the manual provisioner, uh, and we conducted our first benchmarks, uh, those parameters that we got from those were nowhere near our expectations, as in really bad. So, but you know, spoilers alert, we managed to eventually do a pretty good job with this. Uh, so, uh, let's talk about the container storage interface. Uh, this interface uh, I was using uh, during the development of CSISFS 
And now let's see why and what it actually is. So let's imagine this scenario uh, where we've uh, created this uh, storage system. We would like to get it to as many of customers as possible. And in order to do that, we need to integrate the storage system into existing infrastructures of our users so that people can actually use it, right? So let's say our customers are interested in container technologies. So we'll focus on those and we want to target the container orchestrators one, two, and three. So uh, that means we'll probably have to have three uh, separate teams developing storage drivers for those three orchestrators so that our storage can talk to those orchestrators. Oh. Uh, let's say uh, that after some time we are done, our customers are happy, and now we are left with three separate storage drivers, which essentially do the same thing. They map the storage system to the container orchestrator. Now, that's really not what we are looking for because we have a few problems. This lack of uh, standardization between orchestrators is pushing our development and maintenance costs up. Another pro problem is usually those drivers are a part of the orchestrator's code base, uh, which means that, uh, you know, adding features and fixing bugs is particularly hard simply because those drivers are now tightly uh, coupled with the release cycles of those orchestrators. Uh, due to this uh, tight coupling, bugs in those drivers uh, can propagate uh, through the, you know, through other components of the orchestrators and crash different parts. So, uh, wouldn't it be nice if we had, you know, a common interface between all of those orchestrators? That way we would only write a single driver and use it everywhere else. So, of course, I'm talking about the, in the, the container storage interface, CSI, which is the industry standard for uh, cluster-wide storage plugins. It's being developed as a collaboration of communities, including Kubernetes, Mesos, Docker, and Cloud Foundry. And it basically defines an interface between the orchestrator and the plugin. Uh, so from this, you can see it's not just an uh, a simple interface, it's a whole protocol defining be the be behavior for both the orchestrator and the plugin. So the end goal here is to have only a single uh, storage plugin and use it everywhere else in, in a, any CSI enabled container orchestrator. So uh, the first alpha version of CSI was released in December 2017 with uh, already working implementation in uh, Kubernetes 1.9. Of course, things have changed significantly since then. Uh, and for people like me who are already uh, using this interface and writing drivers, uh, it was sometimes a bit difficult to follow, but things are considerably more stable now. And actually just today was released the first um, well, the second release candidate of the stable version 1.0, and this, you know, the latest uh, stable version is uh, scheduled by the end of this month. So now let's have a look at the actual structure of uh, CSI. Uh, so the specification defines three uh, services that deal with storage in container orchestrators. The first one being the identity service which allows uh, the orchestrator to query for plugins, uh, you know, capabilities, hold probes, and other metadata. Then we have the sort of control plane of the plugin, the controller service, which creates, deletes, lists, volumes, and their snapshot. And lastly, we have the node service, which stages and publishes volumes uh, on a node, making them available to workloads on that particular node. So all of those uh, services then form a CSI plugin. Now, this CSI plugin can be you know, compiled and 
you have a single executable file, or you can actually split it into two separate plugins, which can be deployed at uh, their places in the cluster. Uh, so regardless of the structure, orchestrators talk to CSI plugin using the gRPC framework over a simple Unix domain socket, with the orchestrator being the client issuing RPCs on the CSI plugin, and you know, the plugin comes up with some sort of response for those. So really quick look at the RPCs themselves. So uh, for controller service, we have create, delete volume, as I mentioned earlier. For controller, publish volume, uh, this one uh, attaches a volume to a certain node. This, this is uh, required for storage systems that require uh, to know in advance which node is going to consume that particular volume. For node service, we have node stage volume, uh, which prepares that volume before it's uh, consumed by workload. And then we have node publish volume, which actually exposes this volume to the workload and is ready to use. And lastly, the identity service, uh, which uh, provides information about the plugin. You can see some of those items being uh, grayed out. That's because they are optional. And that's simply because not all storage systems require, for example, volume attachments. So that's why controller publish is uh, optional. The same goes for node stage volume. And the actual, and actually, the whole controller service is marked as optional because you know, we need to accommodate, accommodate node service plugins only. Okay, so the way this is uh, implemented in Kubernetes, uh, there is quite a long and really good documentation on Kubernetes websites. But the gist of it is that there are four main components that we deal with CSI in Kubernetes. The first one being uh, Kubelet itself, which implements the entry volume plugin uh, for CSI and acts as a client for the node service. Then it uh, basically just calls the node stage and node publish volume when necessary. Uh, then we have sidecar containers. Uh, those uh, accommodate the rest of the RPC. So if we take a look at the right side, right side of the slide, let that be our Kubernetes cluster, and let those uh, little uh, logos be our node, uh, be, be our nodes. Uh, now, let's say we want to deploy the plugin in a such, such way that every node will have access to our storage. What do we do? You simply deploy it as a daemon set and be done with it. But that's not really enough, because even though each node is now running an instance of the plugin, uh, Kubernetes has no knowledge that those are actually CSI plugins and that, it, that those can be used. For that, we need the driver registrar, which uh, uses the Kubelet plugin discovery in order to register, it, register the uh, plugin with Kubelet. Then we have external provisioner and attacher. Those function in a very similar manner of uh, hooking up into Kubernetes event system and you know, responding to events. We have the, uh, in the provisioner, uh, this one is interested in uh, persistent volume claims and responds to those events. So when the user you know, is uh, either creating or deleting PVCs, the appropriate RPCs got called. Uh, the same goes for the attacher, where the control publish or unpublish is called when a volume is about to be attached to a node. OK, so finally, to something I've been working on, so I just don't talk about other people's work. Uh, Okay, so the CSI plugin for the Ceph file system provides an interface uh, between a CSI enabled container orchestrator and the Ceph cluster. Uh, using this plugin, users can uh, 
provision and use CFFS volumes uh, from container co uh, orchestrator. So uh, for mounting, it supports both the kernel CFFS client as well as the uh, fuse driver, and users can p pick between those two options on a per volume basis. Uh, this is useful because those two options don't provide the same features or performance, so uh, one might be more uh, useful in some cases than the other. Uh, so comparing this CSI plugin to the Kubernetes in 3 CFS volume plugin, which uh, it currently contains, so the general idea behind uh, current implementations of uh, in three volume plugins in Kubernetes is that eventually those, or at least majority of those, should be migrated to CSI plugins. So this is one of them. Uh, since this is a CSI plugin, it's completely decoupled from Kubernetes. We have the ability to choose between mounting tools. And of course, there is some, still some functionality left to uh, do like volume expansion and taking snapshots. So now moving on to the Manila and Kubernetes. So uh, Manila provisioner brings OpenStack Manila and Kubernetes sort of closer together in a sense where users can now create Manila shares from within uh, Kubernetes cluster. What it essentially does, it just uh, maps Manila shares to pers Kubernetes persistent volume ob objects, and those can be then used uh, just like any other volume type uh, yeah, in, in, in pods. Uh, currently, only CFFS is supported just because that's what we've been interested in during development, but uh, it can be easily extended for other types as well. For authentication, uh, it supports both user credentials as well as trustees, and there is a really cool use case for this, Magnum. Yeah, okay, so I, I can pick it up. So in, as I mentioned, at CERN, we have a lot of uh, container clusters, mo and they're all deployed with Magnum, with OpenStack Magnum. So the fact that uh, the plugin supports both user credentials and trustees makes, uh, s makes it possible for us to, because the clusters are already deployed with a trustee user inside, it means that a user doesn't have to provide any additional credentials. Whatever the credentials the cluster was deployed with, uh, will uh, be, you, you can use them to create shares, to, to talk to Keystone, to to do uh, all sorts of OpenStack operations, so that means that it simplifies a lot the setup. So for us, like the, the fact that there are CSIs there, it makes it really useful, useful so that we minimize the development effort. Now, this was a, an overview of the different components, so we'll quickly jump to benchmarks. So um, we started the benchmarks with a couple of goals. So we have many different use cases to use containers at CERN. We just have to make sure that they actually work. And then we needed also to make sure that uh, when you define a, a persistent volume claim in Kubernetes, and if you're doing it in GKE, that it works the same in OpenStack. So that's uh, the Manila provisioner comes in. Uh, and then one of the goals we wanted is to see that the CSI driver side, not really test FFS, but see that the CSI driver behaves well even when things go wrong. Uh, so that's why we tested with a, a smaller cluster uh, and we put a lot of load so that we would create some, some problems underneath and see how the, the plugin reacts. So the client is using Kubernetes 1.12. Uh, the version of CSI CFS was 0.3.1. And we used two safe clusters. One is called White and it has uh, three, only three nodes with spinning drives. Um, and it's running in Luminous. Uh, the other one is uh, slightly bigger. So it's the cluster we use for uh, uh, HPC, and it's a 300 uh, node cluster, or 300 S uh, uh, OSDs, all with SSDs, uh, also with Luminous, and it's hyper-converged, meaning we are sharing compute and storage. And then maybe you want to explain a bit the methodology? Yes. Uh, so uh, what we did for the benchmarks uh, to the actual process, uh, we had a Kubernetes cluster of 100 nodes, and for each of those, each of the tests that uh, we ran is that we 
provisioned a certain number of CFFS shares using the manual provisioner. Then we created a deployment with a certain number of replicas, and those were sized as to uh, so that each pod of those replicas would be scheduled onto a separate node. Uh, because that's why we, uh, that's how we tested the exact number of uh, connections to the Ceph cluster. Uh, then each of those pods would then mount all of those shares that we provisioned earlier, and then we would take our measurements. So as for the actual tests, uh, we have the uh, first batch of the test were, were idle, where we basically did nothing with the shares, and we just wanted to see how well this setup scales. And as for the busy tests, uh, we made each pod unpack a large archive. So in our case, this was the Linux kernel source code, and this was a way of uh, doing a sort of stress test on uh, safe metadata servers. And we stress them pretty good. Okay. So as for parameters, uh, for idle tests, uh, we provisioned 100 uh, shares per 100 replicas, making up for 10,000 idle clients. And for busy tests, uh, we had 10 shares per 100 replicas, making up for 1,000 clients simultaneously unpacking the Linux kernel. Cool. So the first go at it was to, to start low. Um, so we didn't go straight to 10,000 uh, idle clients. We started with 10 shares and 100 rep replicas, which would mean 1,000 idle clients. And the outcome was not immediately very good. Um, so we saw a bunch of errors so, that uh, Robert was happy to debug after. So. This one basically says uh, it's a complaint for uh, wait for attach from the CSI uh, volume plugin in the kublet. Uh, and it basically says that the node authenticator is not able to, uh, is not giving access to certain nodes for volume attachment objects. So, uh, yeah, next. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, what we learned from this is that provisioning of the shares worked just fine. I mean, it was just 10 shares uh, in this case. Some pods uh, were up and running with those shares mounted, but others that reported this error, uh, they wouldn't recover. They, uh, as in, no amount of waiting would make them run. Uh, so, yeah. here. So the next attempt was to cheat. Uh, so instead of immediately fixing the problem, we tried to hide it by doing a loop where we would kill the pods that would get into this trouble and try to get a bit higher in the number of clients. We knew this wouldn't be a real solution, but we wanted some proper numbers. So we got to this, which is, doesn't look that nice. But eventually we managed to get to 650 clients, concurrent clients somehow. Uh, but it was really slow and very ugly. Um, so that wasn't good. So, so for our third attempt, by that time, uh, Kubernetes 1.12 uh, was out, along with driver registrar 0 0.4. And those brought some pretty interesting features, like Kubelet plugin registration, uh, where driver registrar can tell Kubelet to use or not use certain features. One of those was the CSI skip attach feature. So what it actually does, uh, so, so the, the, way, uh, uh, the way this worked prior to Kubernetes 1.12 was uh, we had uh, so basically when Kubelet sees that a pod is requesting a CSI volume, uh, it will create a volume attachment object for that particular volume and wait for the volume to be marked as attached. Meanwhile, uh, Kubelet node number two is waiting. The external attacher has caught this uh, volume attachment object, node number one, 
and uh, it will do something with it, and eventually it will mark the volume as attached so that kubelet on node number two can continue. And this was done, done for all CSI volumes simply because uh, the uh, volume attachments are in the domain of uh, controller plugin. But as you can see on node number two, we have only node plugin, so kubelet cannot make any assumptions on this. So it will leave the decision uh, whether to actually attach or not attach the volume for external attacher. Now, with the CSI skip attach feature, uh, driver registrar can tell Kublet that this volume, this plugin really doesn't need uh, volume attachments, so it can skip the whole attachment process, which solved the issue. So, so. Right, so once we finally thought we had fixed it, and actually it ended up we did, we went to the, the maximum number of clients we, we had uh, from the start, the idea to, to deploy. Uh, we did, so th this means that we had 100 Manila shares being created, and all those shares were mounted on every single node in the cluster. So 100 times 100, we had 10,000 fuse mounts, which corresponds to 10,000 uh, clients in, in, on the CFFS side. Um, we did this gradually, so uh, we didn't want to go in one go to, to 10,000, but to do it in a controlled way. So we are deploying here, each five replicas, it's five times 100, so we are doing 500 clients, adding 500 clients at a time. In half an hour, we had uh, 10,000, and this is how it looks. So these are the sessions on the Ceph uh, um, MDS, uh, the metadata server, and you can see it gradually going up. And it, everything looks good. In addition, we had the cluster has three active MDSs, and you can see that they're balanced really well, uh, which is kind of perfect um, from, from this plot. We had a lot of other plots. We have a lot of information. If you're interested, uh, we, we have plenty of information from the Ceph side. Here we say, see the namespace rates. It's a bit weird that the idle clients are creating so much load on the, on the, names, on the namespace server. This is something we want to investigate further. Same for the pool I.O. It's not completely clear why idle clients would do uh, uh, this much I.O. On the, on, the, on the metadata. And here we see also the amount of requests that is quite high. So also the CPU load on the MDS servers uh, was quite high. The, the cluster was clearly uh, under provision for this kind of test, but this was the goal from the start. So this is interesting for us further things to investigate. Uh, we did see a couple of uh, um, interesting logs. So here we see that some clients uh, from time to time are evicted from the cluster. Uh, we, we don't know exactly why. It might just be a question of, of the tuning of the, of the timeout for, for the fuse clients. Uh, but it, it does mean that the, the, the CSI driver was uh, properly reconnecting uh, and we wouldn't see the issue. But on the Ceph side, we do see this reported. Uh, another thing we saw is that some uh, uh, kubelet, some nodes in the cluster would flip uh, to not ready, meaning that you couldn't schedule new workloads on them. This is something that it's not uh, really understood by us right now, so we'll keep investigating. Uh, but they will come back to ready in a matter of seconds, uh, but they sh this shouldn't happen. Now, uh, for the busy benchmark, uh, so this, this was really like just clients doing a sleep and uh, just keeping the connection open. Uh, for the busy benchmark, we were extracting the Linux kernel, and the, the goal was really to uh, break something. Uh, this is the main goal of, the, of this exercise, and we did. Uh, so here is a plot again of the MDS servers, uh, the Ceph side, uh, the MDS demons, and it, there's something really interesting, because this cluster has three active MDSs, but it actually has a standby MDS, and you can see that one of the MDSs went into trouble, and the standby picked it up immediately. So from our side, we actually didn't see any issue, uh, but Seth managed to recover, as it often does. Uh, but we did crash something at some point, which is an achievement, always. Uh, especially when we have our main Seth expert that uh, many of you might know, that uh, sends us messages like this, and this may makes our day usually. Uh, this was a clearly an achievement. Now, a bonus benchmark that we did is deleting 10,000 uh, uh, clients. So we had started 10,000 clients. Here we are deleting them. 
everything went smooth from the Kubernetes side. We couldn't see any issue. All the shares disappeared. All the uh, persistent volumes disappeared from, from Kubernetes. But in the Manila side, we did see some of the shares uh, being stuck in deleting. Uh, and we went there and we triggered a first delete. And still, in some cases, this wasn't enough. So we kicked uh, the Manila share demon, and this uh, uh, fixed the issue. But it's something that we will try to reproduce again to, to try to fix. Uh, here, it's the plot again of the, the sessions disappearing quite quickly. So here, we are not nice. We just kill them all in one go. So as a conclusion. OK, so uh, yeah, what you can take from this is, first of all, there is uh, this uh, standard storage interface for container orchestrators, uh, which makes uh, really a powerful tool to have storage drivers for any number you know, of con container orchestrators, as long as, of course, they support the protocol. But this definitely ma made my life easier while developing the CSSFS. Uh, it works very nicely in Kubernetes, although there are some issues, as we saw earlier. Uh, those are being investigated, but uh, that's completely understandable uh, since this is really a new piece of software. Uh, other orchestrators are, will fall with their implementations very soon because, as I mentioned, uh, the stable 1.0 is com coming up very shortly. Uh, Mesos has already some implementation of this. Uh, as for the benchmarks, what we saw is that both Manila Provisioner and CSISFS can handle uh, large uh, concurrency pretty well. We saw some hiccups, but those will be investigated as well. And it's basically in a state where it's really usable uh, and it's actually deployed at CERN and users can use it on a yeah, daily basis. So as for the next step where to uh, go from here, uh, there is an, a plan to add the manual uh, volume expansion and snapshots for CSISFS and for Manila. Uh, to, tra to transform Manila Provisioner into a Z CSI plugin because uh, man since Manila Provisioner is a you know, Kubernetes-specific uh, piece of so software, uh, making it a CSI plugin will enable users to access Manila shares from any orchestrator that supports CSI. So, yeah, that's... Yeah. I think that's it. So we have some time for questions, so feel free to come. Right. <laughs> cool. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, did you, uh, with the tests with creating the shares, did you try to ramp up the velocity to uh, create them more frequently, or did you stop at the uh, at the benchmark which you presented here? Right. So we we you mean like the the rate of creation of new yeah. clients? Yes. Uh, so we started doing that uh, to create uh, more quickly. But we didn't want to do it in this test cluster because it's really undersized for for the load we were putting. So we will do it in this other cluster that we have. We don't have the numbers here, but we will publish them uh, soon, yeah, as soon as we have them. Okay, thank you. And uh, just another quick question. Uh, what was the uh, resolution of the, uh, um, of the graphs? Because I, I think it was 20 minutes, right? Uh, or didn't I get it? Uh... Uh, we can have a look at one of them. See, this one. Ah, this one is five minutes. Right. Mm -hmm. So we ramped up the, the clients uh, over like 30, min 30 minutes, so something like that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, to be honest, we, 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 we don't expect, uh, the, the, the promise is that the MDS is uh, at the safe side 
will scale horizontally. So if we add more clients, we'll, we can add more MDS, uh, or at least this is what our Ceph uh, admins uh, promise. So we'll, we'll be testing this. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Cool. If there's no more questions. So, ah, one so, so you can reproduce the uh, issue where you do the deletes and make Manila share hang? Say again, sorry? Can you reproduce the issue where you uh, make Manila share service hang up by doing the deletes? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So give we, us the logs. We'll work definitely, on it. definitely. So we, we actually managed to, to reproduce the issue on both clusters. Uh, so we, we, we have collected everything to, to send it upstream. Yeah. Cool. Okay, thank you very Good. much. Thank you very much. <laughs>